coming up on today's show. It's surprising how paralyzing your desk can be because you come in and you're completely overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. So getting your or- desk organized is a gateway to being more productive. What, what would, where would you start? You know, sometimes we look at it and we are overwhelmed, but we got to start somewhere. What's the best way to get started with uh, getting your desktop organized? You know, one of the biggest things I think people object to is when people walk in your office and just put something on your desk or on your uh, computer keyboard. And so I suggest having just a wall pocket so they can drop it off, not even come in your office if you want them not to. Easy ways to organize your desk. We kick off Go Month today on Keeping You Organized. Hello and welcome to Keeping You Organized and welcome to Go Month. It's part of the National Association of Professional Organizers uh, annual January tradition. And uh, we are going to talk about easy ways to get your desk organized. I think everyone likes to start the new year off that way. And with us is our friend Ellen DeLapp from professional-organizer.com. Ellen, how are you today? Great. How are you doing, John? I am just as good as I deserve, I guess, is a, is a good line. But uh, anyway, uh, we're going to get right into it today because I know that uh, here's how I feel. When I have my desk really messy uh, and sometimes I just can't do anything else. I say, okay, well, my desk is so messy, I, don't, I can't do anything. So I think getting your desk organized and, and looking really good and functional really actually helps you do a lot more. Don't you agree? Absolutely. It's surprising how paralyzing your desk can be because you come in and you're completely overwhelmed. You don't know where to start. So getting your desk organized is a gateway to being more productive. Now, as a professional organizer, I'm sure you have uh, a certain number of tips or uh, uh, steps to getting your desk organized. What, what would, where would you start? You know, sometimes we look at it and we are overwhelmed, but we got to start somewhere. What's the best way to get started with uh, getting your desktop organized? Well, for me, it's all about creating great systems, and systems have to do with the products you might use to help you get organized, creating ways that you go about your workflow. So one of the first steps I always suggest is to have a command center, a place where all those actionable items come together, because often actionable gets piled under filing, and so it's at a loss. So those command centers really help people get started. What what does a command center maybe look like? What is it uh, comprised of? So it can take various shapes. So when you look at a desktop sorter, which is a box that might sit on the top of your desk that has hanging files in it, that's one visual. A lot of people are using the vertical space in their office, so they're using wall pockets and uh, cork boards and dry erase boards, so that's another way. Or it can just be the... um, a uh, inclined sorter that's on your desk. So it depends on how visual you want to make it. Most of us, the more visual, the better. And so some of the components of the command center make a difference as well. What, what advice would you have for our producer, Leanne, who likes to take you know these post-it notes and she's got about uh, 15 of them around the border of her uh, computer screen. Uh, how do you deal with that? Because yeah, it's visual, it's right there, it's a good reminder, but so, so, you know, sooner or later you get too many visual reminders, I think. Exactly. Being overly visual is just as much a stumbling block. So I would suggest that Leanne take those notes and either use the um, cork board in front of her office or she could use a spiral notebook that she can put those post-it notes into and still be equally visual. There's also um, an on-the-wall poster that you can put all of those post-it notes and rearrange them. Sometimes people with post-it notes are kinesthetic learners too. So they like to be able to move them around and by creating, even just using a glass window pane to rearrange them and prioritize them can make a difference. So Leanne, I'm going to check in on that later and see how it's coming. Now, do you think like someone who uses post-it notes, is that kind of in place of a to-do list or is it maybe a variety of things? Is it, you know, well, some things that, you know, like, well, God forbid, passwords to your computer, but yeah. you know other things like that. I mean, do you find that there's a, a certain kind of thing that people put on those post-it notes? I think it's really great because people use post-it notes to get things off their mind, which is excellent. So it's just a way of them taking the next step, creating a to-do list in another visual manner, which I really think is a great idea. 
Okay. Well, let's get back to the. We get. We've got the command center, and it's probably a little different for each person. Maybe different components to it. Uh, what's kind of the next step that we need in order to to get that desk organized? So I like to also have our resources easily available, and that's another thing that people have on their desks is a lot of information that they need to refer to frequently. So you could store that in a notebook or in one of the desk drawers in the hanging files. So it's easy access, you don't have to get up from your desk, you just lean over so it's right there for you. And then the other thing I think people have on their desk is just things that have to be filed. So if you can just place them in a spot where they're all together. You know, one of the biggest things I think people object to is when people walk in your office and just put something on your desk or on your uh, computer keyboard. And so I suggest having just a wall pocket so they can drop it off, not even come in your office if you want them mm -hmm. not to. So you don't have to worry about, oh, where, where was I and what do I need to do with this? And it's in the way of what you're really working on. Now, the key to making something that like that work is having like a system for emptying it. Or um, So how do you work that into your you know, daily workflow so that you're making sure you don't miss that urgent notice that someone put in that wall pocket? Right. So I like to have what I call triage. So you're going through the urgent, culling them out, getting them right in front of you. And then the rest of it in these command centers, you can have a slot for filing. You can have a slot for your assistant or someone who you're working with, one of your colleagues. And then front and center is just the actionable piece that you have to get done that day. Now, don't you think part of getting a desk organized is maybe having a, a greater system of kind of time management, task management, calendars. How does all that, especially like a calendar, how does that work into your desk? Because, I mean, there's all kinds of different calendars. Right. So I think that um, one of the first steps is to have a routine that gets things paper-wise, email-wise, and calendar-wise. So starting off your day with actually not attending to your email, attending to some of the things, this triage, just quickly in the morning and quickly in the afternoon, and then setting aside some times that are dedicated to the productivity periods. I call them power periods. So when you create a routine that's more efficient for yourself, your desk stays clear. Well, let's take uh, that triage routine. Let's maybe unpack it a little bit and try to get, uh, what are some of the like details of that? How, how might that look maybe with one of the clients you've worked with? I mean, I'm sure it's different for everybody. I mean, but they're probably common elements of a, of a daily routine. And like, how would that maybe lay out into a step-by-step -step, uh, process? So starting out for your morning, the first hour with whatever is most pressing, what's most important. And hopefully the night before, so each evening, you're making a list of the three most important tasks. So those tasks may or may not have to do with what the paper is, but at least you know specifically, I need to come and work on them right away. Then breaking up your day where you're going on to do your triage, then do a little bit of email, and then go back into the same routine in the afternoon, an hour of your productivity period, go back to your email. What's happening, I think, is that people don't realize you can pull things out of your email and out of your papers and get them on this manageable to-do list, and they'll be more visual in a different way, and it'll keep your desk clear as a result. Right. Yeah, now, I, I have to admit my own thing. I, ha I have kind of like a, a end-of-the-day little reminder and an outlook that says, you know, kind of get ready for the next day, and, you know, it's an idealistic thing, but I find myself, I don't know, I, I, maybe it's just uh, my, my habits, but blowing that off. You know, no, I think it, that's pretty common. And I think <laughs> what happens is that people get to the end of the day and they actually have to get out the door. And so right. you have to back that up. You have to give yourself really a boundary where it's like, this is my real time that I'm going to finish, yeah. whatever time that is, but allow for a half an hour of grabbing things to get them to go with you whether you're, when you're leaving the office, and just spending five minutes is all it takes to write that little list up. Right. And so you're an advocate of for the next day having like at least the three most important things. What if one of those most important things is like takes three or four hours or uh, anything like, because that's another kind of struggle. I feel like I'm being self-analyzed here today, but you know, it's <laughs> January, it's go month. I'm trying to get a little more organized myself, but uh, you know, trying to, uh, it's sometimes easier to do that little 10 minute task than it is like starting on that big project that's going to be, you know, three or four hours, even though it's probably the most important thing I need to do. How do you kind of attack that? Well, first of all, just 
just going to say that that's productive procrastination, John. So you're getting something checked uh -oh. off. So I'm excited about that. Okay. But to do the um, big task, we just need to break it down into little baby steps that can fit into an hour. And then what I love is between those hours, you can have a little percolation time. So it gives you the opportunity to think back and reflect, oh, how did this really work out? Did I like the way it's going? Rather than try to do it all at one time. So I'm a big advocate of baby steps. I talk about them all the time. Okay, well, that, it's kind of getting a little into project management, but um, I, we're gonna take a quick break here and when we come back, I wanna talk more about you know how you you know, set up routines for your desk and, and other little tips and tricks that you might have for making, you know, it easier to organize our desks. So uh, we'll take that break. We'll be back with Ellen DeLapp, professional-organizer.com in just a moment. Are you looking to get your office organized but don't know where to start? And what can you really do to keep your office organized? Smeet has put together a new ebook to help you answer these exact questions. We've compiled the best tips from professional organizers around the country to help you tackle the most common office organizing challenges. Go to smeet.com slash office organization and get your free copy today. That's smeet.com forward slash office organization. The new organization for the office ebook from Smeed, keeping you organized. We are back now on Keeping You Organized. Uh, it's Go Month for NAPO, and uh, we are talking about easy ways to organize your desk with Ellen DeLapp from uh, professional-organizer.com. And uh, Ellen, tell us a little bit uh, before we get back into the desk thing about Go Month and uh, kind of why NAPO does it and, and what is it supposed to accomplish in, in the hearts and minds of those trying to get organized? What I love about our National Association, it's designated the time of year when we all naturally want to have a fresh start as Go Month, Get Organized Month. So around the country, our NAPO colleagues are celebrating, quote unquote, by having special events. Some of our chapters have special events, but it's all about bringing to the top of mind and the awareness of how we can get more organized and how much better our lives will be for it. Well, hey, that is a great prescription, and I think a lot of people are kind of in the mood. They just want to, everyone wants a fresh start, and uh, we won't get into the statistics of how many people, like, don't keep their resolutions after, That's you know, right. 27 days or whatever, but uh, let's kind of get back into the easy ways to organize your desk. You know, before the break, we were talking about, uh, we wanted to set up the command center. That was that was one thing with some pieces that will help us kind of take some of the clutter off and, and give it a home. Uh, we talked about the uh, triage uh, piece where we, uh, we come up with a routine that's going to help us figure out, you know, what we need to do with what and when. What are some of the other things that we need to keep in mind, uh, other steps, other tricks, tips that you can give for uh, you know, getting our desk organized? Well, I find along with post-its, a lot of shrines on people's mm. uh, desks, like too many photographs, too many little cute tchotchkes. So I just suggest that people pare down to three of their favorite photos and maybe one inspiration. So that will help them regain a little bit of their desk space as well as look a little bit more orderly. Um, in terms of what you might keep on your desk, just think about what you use daily. Those are the things that deserve to be out. If they're not used daily, you can certainly store them some in one of the desk drawers so that they're adjacent to where you are. And then also think about the products you're using. I think having a little coordination with color can be very inspirational to us as well. So. Well, how about Just this, using products like that. How, how about this this myth? I know it's a myth of people who say, "Well, I'm just a creative type. You know, I've you know I've got to have a messy desk because that's just who I am." Uh, what do you say to people like that? I think they need to give themselves an opportunity to be more creative with a blank canvas. Is mm -hmm. what I say. Okay. So having the blank canvas, like an artist, would be able to have you you know think more clearly, but also just be more creative and not held back. Right. Okay, so uh, we've got got that. What else? Do, what else do you have? Any other little uh, things that can uh, make a difference in our desk? Well, I always feel about labeling. Um, I'm a big over labeler. I like <laughs> to say, and I think that makes a difference on definitely the different slots. Like some of the clients that I work with have um, just uh, little other resources out. So if the basket or box is labeled, 
as well. I think it makes it easy to put things away. And then just to be aware of, you know, what kind of resources are in, you know, around you and how you work best. Because some of us, although most of us are very visual, some of us really do like to have some other little tweaks like sound, soft noises, what's going to call you to work in your workspace. Sometimes it's even the arrangement of your room, like um, facing or being sideways to the door, having an L-shaped desk or a credenza behind you so you can have a little bit more storage. Mm -hmm. So just the physical arrangement can really make a difference. You know, one thing I've been experimenting with this in, the, in this last year is a stand-up desk. Yes. Uh, and I, I, I really actually like it. It's good because it you know, kind of keeps you engaged. You know, you can still sit down if you have to. Uh, but uh, wh what have you heard about stand-up desks and how they play into the, the picture? I think people are a lot more engaged and aware when they're at stand-up desks. There's also a big variety in seating now. Some people are using those big yoga balls and different mm -hmm. kinds of seating so they can, you know, take advantage of being more alert and aware when they're doing their work as well. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk about some of your uh, current clients and their desk challenges because you're out seeing a lot of this. What are kind of the most uh, frequently seen you know, desk faux pas that are out there that uh, really can be easily solved? The most biggest the um, faux pas well, that you're seeing? Yeah, like it, 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 that you're seeing in, mm -hmm. in, in, in the clients. I mean, what's a common, what are the common ones that are uh, causing people the most frustration? Well, the most common ones, I think, are feeling like they don't have enough space because their computer takes up a lot of room, even when it's a flat screen. And so as a result, they're feeling very squashed. Um, a lot of people visualize basically what's called a pedestal desk. It's like four legs. And so they need some auxiliary storage. So I usually recommend a file cart for them so that they can glide up to where they're working and then their file cart can also trail them off to another space that they might be working in. So, you know, lack of space because so many people are in cubicles and smaller spaces than they used to have. The other thing is to just um, spend that few extra minutes like you've described. A lot of the same experiences you're having, how things get piled up quickly and so just spending a few extra minutes at the end of the day makes the biggest difference for them. Right. Well, and how about just psychologically with, uh, you know, maybe the decor or, or in your in your workspace, what can people do to make it like a little more fun or a little more, you know, just engaging, you know, so it's not like everyone has the same looking desk. How do you add personality, I guess I'm saying? I think for me, it's about color and it's about some small changes that you can make that are using walls and as well as just one or two frames. Your frames should match in color and be about the same size so that they add serenity and consistency as well as adding your personal flavor to the, to the environment. Right. What, what is your opinion on whiteboards and, and you know, having a lot of your to-dos and your you know, things visually there on this large, big white I'm actually a really big fan of Pinterest. So okay. I see a lot of people that are using um, frames that they've repurposed oh. from different um, stores and adding cork. And so I love them when they are repurposed because they have their own personality then. You know, I do work in offices that are very sterile and I think sometimes that makes people feel a little put off. So I do always recommend adding a few special touches to that. Right. Well, it gives everyone a little bit more uh, ownership to, to what they have. Yes. And even, in fact, I think sometimes people don't feel that that person has buy into their job if right. they have nothing in their cubicle. So it can have the opposite effect. Now, now, one more question regarding just orientation in the office. Do you think that you should face the door or have your back to the door? Never have your back to the door. It's okay. so very unnatural for us. But you could have your side to the door. And sometimes you're in a room where there's uh, multiple entries. I've worked on offices like that. where So thinking about you know facing the path that the entry is going to be in, that can be helpful too. So uh, never have your back to the door. It's, um, it's very uncomfortable for you. And you'll find that you feel uncomfortable generally. Okay. Now uh, we're almost done here. I, I want to make sure we've We've exhausted all your tips. Anything else that you have uh, have uh, in your little bag there? Well, I would say that um, as long as you're thinking about your office, just think of it as what would 
be a compelling or something tether you to the space itself. So make it personal and make it inviting. So it's an important part of the whole process. That's great. Well, listen, we have just a moment or two here, but I want to give you the opportunity to talk about professional-organizer.com. That's your website and your company. And uh, what are some of the services you offer as, and, uh, and do you do virtual uh, consulting as well? I do. I work um, primarily in the Houston, Texas area. I do virtual organizing with my clients all over the country. I'm a certified professional organizer. And I also have specialty certificates in working with ADHD clients and chronically disorganized. Primarily my clients are um, ADD and ADHD women and I love my work with them. They are brilliant, resourceful, and we make such a difference together in streamlining their environment, creating routines, and getting them the peace of mind that they really want. And it's professional-organizer.com. Yes. Great. And then, you know, for people who want to find out more about that uh, ADHD, uh, we have a whole other podcast episode back in season one on that. So yes. if they go to smead.com forward slash podcast and look in the beginning episodes of season one, we have you uh, there as well. So, uh, and I, I'm sure we're going to have you back again because the time always flies by so fast and there's so much to talk about. Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate being able to share tips for the desk and the, and the office organizing. Awesome. And, and it's go month. So we are excited to get going here. And uh, uh, now you know how to get that desk organized. Let's just do it this month and get going on keeping you organized. Coming up next time on keeping you organized. Um, the papers that we're talking about, actually, you need to make sure you take care of way before you pass away. But some of those papers are creating a living will so that should you become incapacitated for any reason, your family knows what your wishes are.